Okay, then there are acknowledged messages, and acknowledged messages are automatically acknowledged by, uh, by the receiving side of the link. They're fully bidirectional as well, so you can send an acknowledged message from the master to the slave, and you can do the same from the slave to the master. Still eight bytes of data per message period. And these types of messages are best suited for control applications. So for applications where you need to know whether or not your transmission was successful. Um, a good example of this is a button press. If you press a button, you generally want to know whether that button message got through or not. So you need to know whether um, you need to retry or not. Um, these messages are not automatically retried by end. So your application uh, microprocessor will be informed whether the message was successful or not. But your application MCU will need to handle whether or not it will, um, it will need to retry sending the message. So parts of the AntFS protocol, for those of you who are familiar with that, use uh, acknowledged messaging as part of the handshaking uh, protocol that happens. So if you look at a, a, an acknowledged transaction from a master to the slave, it looks something like this. First of all, the application MCU will need to flag a message as being acknowledged. And that flag will actually be indicated in the over-the-air message that gets sent by AND. So over here, on that very left over here, I have, uh, I have a message that's going to go over the air. And it's flagged as acknowledged. And that's an indicator to the slave that this is a message that requires an acknowledgement. So as soon as the slave receives that message, it's then going to generate its own acknowledged packet. Now that packet has no useful data in it, outside of just saying, hey, I got your message. But it's still the same width as, uh, as a regular message packet. So it keeps the radio on for the same amount of time as any other transaction in the, in the forward direction. The master is then going to receive that information in its Rx window, and then it's going to open up another Rx window to account for coexistence. So right away, I think you can see that uh, doing acknowledged messages uses more power than simple broadcast messages. Going in the other direction, it's similar. So if the slave has an acknowledged message that it wants to send to the master, the host MCU will need to indicate that and send that message flagged as acknowledged to Ant. Ant is going to buffer that message and wait for, uh, to receive a message from the master. <coughs> at which time it'll send a, a flagged acknowledged message back to the master. Master receives that window, that message in its Rx window. It sees that it's an acknowledged message, so it generates an acknowledge packet back to the slave. And of course, the slave is anticipating acknowledge because it knows that it sent an acknowledged packet. And then the master will open up another Rx window to account for coexistence. So again, it's the same situation. It takes a lot more power to send a message from the slave to the master than it does from the master to the slave. Again, something you want to consider as you're designing your, your networks. One thing I want to mention here, when, when we draw these types of diagrams, and you'll see a few of these over the over, in the presentations over the next few days, we generally don't draw out all the mechanics of the channel transactions. What we generally do is we, we compress them to a single blob like I have listed in the, on the left over there. And that kind of assumes all these different uh, mechanics that are listed out here. So generally speaking, you will not see this level of detail in any of our presentations, but I think it's useful to know um, kind of what the consequences are and what the differences are between the different message types. Okay, so the last type of uh, message that we have is the burst message type. And bursting is basically a way of sending data as fast as you can in an optimized way. Um, so you'll, you start bursting, or you start your burst transaction on a channel period, and then you send packets as fast as you can until you run out of data to send. Uh, each packet is sent as an acknowledged, and the, and the packets are actually retried if they fail. And they're retried up to five times. If you fail after five times, your application MCU will be alerted of that failure, and then it needs to decide whether it wants to try again or just to give up. The maximum data rate for burst transactions is 20 kilobits per second. 
And we always say maximum, and then people always ask, you know, what is it actually? And that's going to depend on a couple of things. It's going to depend, first of all, on your serial port speed. So if you've got a serial port that's 9600 baud, don't ask us why you're not getting 20 kilobits per second over the air. The other uh, factor that plays into the equation is the RF interference. So if you're dropping a lot of packets, and if a lot of packets are being, are being um, lost in your transaction and retried by ANT automatically, your application's not going to see that because it's done by ANT. But your effective throughput and what you're going to observe as a user of your device is going to be less than 20 kilobits per second. So 20 kilobits per second is the ideal situation in an ideal RF environment where there's very little interference and you got a very or a, a serial port that's fast enough to keep up with that data transmission. Each packet sent in the burst transaction is eight bytes, uh, eight bytes of data as well. However, you're not sending data at the channel period anymore. You're actually sending data as fast as you can, uh, each one packet after the other. There's no limitation to how much data you can send. You could technically do bursting all day long if you wanted to do, if you had a large file to send, for example. However, uh, it is gonna impact the RF environment that you're in. So if you're in an environment where there's a lot of ant devices, and all of a sudden you start, tr you start bursting data uh, for a long period of time, you do run the risk of interfering with other ant channels because the coexistence mechanism is not designed to deal with that, that number, so many number of messages. And of course, AntFS is very heavily based on bursting. Okay, so now that you guys kind of understand what the, the mechanics of the channel, of, of an ant channel is, you can start looking at more sophisticated types of channels. And over here on this diagram, I have what's called a, uh, a multicast channel. It's also referred to as a shared channel. And when you look at the topology, topology diagram of a shared channel, it actually looks fairly sophisticated. You have this one, uh, one node talking bidirectionally to all these different nodes hanging off of it. And you can actually have up to 65,000 uh, individual nodes sharing one channel. But if you look at this in the time domain, using the same uh, kind of diagrams that I showed you earlier, you can see that all this really is, is a master channel. So the master channel was the one in red, transmitting at some channel period. And then you got a whole series of slave devices that all synchronize to the same master. So if you're just doing broadcast messages, you, you could have an infinite number of slaves synchronized to that channel, and they're all going to receive the same message. But what we've done with shared channels is we've actually reserved the first two bytes of the message payload to specify a slave address. What this allows you to do is it allows you to specify a particular slave that you want to communicate with exclusively in this shared channel. So for example, um, address zero is reserved to talk to everybody. So you can broadcast a message to every one of the shared slave of the shared slaves on the network. And then you can specify and indicate a specific address if you need to. So your master can address slave one, for example, and then only slave one will get that message on that channel period. Same thing with uh, slave two and slave three. So over each channel period that I'm sending data, I can send it to a specific slave device by indicating what the address of that slave device is. Now this is, this is ideal for uh, situations where you have a lot of nodes that you need to send information to, and you're not really in a hurry to, to send it. So as you can see, the latency of this is actually fairly significant. If you have 65,000 different devices, which is the, the maximum amount of devices that you can address, and you're only addressing one single one over each channel period, you could take a long time before you actually send your data to each device. Uh, warehouses um, is a good example of this type of technology where you, for example, want to update the prices of all of your products, and you can let your uh, network run overnight. Now, one problem with this technology as it is, as I presented here, and as it's implemented on the chips, is that 
the master needs to know what the address of the slave it wants to talk to is. It's, it's, it's not a problem if you have a fixed network and if you know exactly which slaves you're going to be talking to, and which slaves are present. However, if you've got a situation where there's slaves coming in and out, for example, if you've got uh, pallets in a, in a warehouse where um, the pallet might be here today, but it might not be there tomorrow, and you only want to talk to the devices that are actually in the vicinity, then this kind of breaks down. So what we did is we introduced something called auto-shared channels. And auto-shared channels are basically an extension of the AND protocol. It's implemented at the application level. And it's, uh, it allows you to implement some handshaking as slaves join this network. And the address of the slave is actually negotiated with the master in a real, on a real-time basis. So as the slave comes into the network, it gets, it gets detected by the master. The master will detect that there's no address assigned to this particular slave. And then it'll assign it a specific address so that the slave isn't trying to talk to all, possible, all possibilities of the 65,000 devices that are out there. It'll only actually try to talk to an address slaves that have joined the network. <coughs> Continuous scanning channels are another technology that um, we introduced fairly recently and it, it addre addresses a fairly neat use case. And with continuous scanning channels, the receiver is always on. It never actually synchronizes to any transmissions of the master. And this is neat because A, it, um, it results in much lower latency, so you never actually go through any kind of searching. You're gonna get the first message that uh, the master sends. And because your radio is on all the time, you're actually enabling many-to-one -one topologies, because all of a sudden you're not limited to receiving messages just from one master. You can receive messages from any master that happens to be transmitting in the RF space that you're operating in. Unfortunately, of course, the radio is on full-time, so you're gonna be fairly high power. Well, you're gonna be very high power. This is not a technology that's really suitable for coin cell operated devices. Uh, I would even say it's not, op it's not suitable for any kind of battery operated devices. But it is suitable for devices that are plugged into the wall. Uh, so for use cases such as remote controls, where latency is a very important um, consideration when the, when the user presses the button. And power is not such a huge thing on the receiving side because your television or your, your, your box top or whatever is plugged into the wall. This is a very nice little feature that you can take advantage of. Uh, scanning channels are still bidirectional. So you can still send data from the scanning channel back to the master. Um, it's a little tricky to do that because you need to take away resources from the other channels or the, or the other uh, structures of the other channels. But it is possible to do. Um, one thing I want to point out here is that the scanning channel uses the entire resources of the radio. So if you've got a scanning channel running, you're not going to be able to establish any other synchronous channels to any other devices if that's what you wanted to do.